Valley Dive Team arrives in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, New York at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. We begin to load our dive equipment aboard the charter dive boat Rebel. We don't get the opportunity to dive the Iberia wreck too often anymore, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed for some good visibility today. As with most inshore shipwrecks, visibility can change dramatically depending on recent weather conditions, and we're just hoping for some decent conditions today. Joining me today is my old friend, Captain Pat DeFay, owner of the Rebel, Captain George Davis, who operates the Rebel, and my dive partner and cameraman, Mike McMeekin. I usually prefer to hook up my regulators before having to deal with the sometimes rough conditions offshore. Today, I'll be utilizing a single Sherwood 120 cubic foot Genesis tank, which will provide more than an adequate air supply for the planned duration of our dive to the Iberia. Note that we've also mounted Knight Rider lights onto our dry hoods. The battery pack is conveniently secured to the tank. The system is quite powerful and allows for hands-free illumination. I also secure my lift bag to the tank. I found that by mounting the bag sideways allows easy access while eliminating the excess drag of a dangling lift bag. The group of divers on board the Rebel today is a charter from Seahorse Dive Center in Brooklyn, New York. The group consists of novice and experienced divers alike. Novice divers will enjoy the Iberia's relatively shallow depth, while experienced wreck divers like to dig through her remains in search of artifacts. Uh, the Rebel's a fast boat. Uh, After Captain George nine, gives the group so a briefing on diving off the Rebel, on it's time to cast board. off and be on our way. The Rebel is a 42-foot aluminum charter boat that runs out of Sheepshead Bay. This location allows the captain to choose from a wide assortment of shipwreck destinations. The Rebel was originally built as a crew boat for the oil industry. Captain Pat purchased the vessel and had her converted and customized into a first-class charter dive boat. The Rebel is now one of the fastest charter dive boats on Long Island. A maximum cruising speed of nearly 22 knots assures divers quick rides to many of New York and New Jersey's most exciting shipwrecks. The Rebel runs seven days a week from the end of April through November of each year. Today, Captain George has charted a course that will take us 14 miles and only half an hour to reach the Iberia wreck. The Iberia sits off Long Beach on the south shore of Long Island in an area we know as Wreck Valley. Captain George also calls this same area Rebel Country. As we cruise through Rockaway Inlet, we pass the Rockaway Beach jetty off our port side. We can see that it's not exactly a picture-perfect day. The weather forecast calls for slight overcast conditions with the chance of light showers. The sea conditions, however, are flat calm with only a mild breeze blowing lightly out of the southeast. As we cruise offshore, let's now take a look at the history of the freight steamer Iberia. The Iberia, an old tramp steamer, was owned by merchants in France. She was built in 1881 by the S&H Morton Company in Scotland. The Iberia displaced 1,388 tons, was 255 feet long, and had a 36-foot beam. The Iberia was under the command of Captain Sargolis and was bound from the Persian Gulf to New York. She developed engine trouble just a few miles off Long Island, where she lay at anchor for three weeks awaiting repairs. On Saturday, November 10, 1888, the 520-foot-long Cunard luxury liner Umbria, bound for Liverpool, encountered a dense fog. At 1.18 p.m., the Iberia was spotted steaming slowly into the path of the Umbria. Although engines were put into full reverse, the Umbria sliced off the stern of the ill-fated Iberia. Both ships remained near each other at anchor overnight, but by the next morning, the Iberia was noticeably lower in her stern. Within hours, a bulkhead gave way, sending the Iberia, plus her cargo of dates, coffee, and wool, to rest in 60 feet of water. The Iberia's bulkheads and sides have broken down over the years, leaving her ribs and wreckage scattered over a sandy bottom. Divers can still find wood crates that once contained her cargo of dates or swim over her large four-bladed steel propeller. Divers will also recognize her engine, which provides the highest relief on the site, her boilers, and her bow section, which sits at a right angle to the main wreckage. Captain George locates the Iberia's sunken remains by utilizing the Rebel's Loran and depth recorder. 
Before long, the Rebel is anchored up and it's time to go diving. A small fishing boat is also anchored over the site. This wreck is home to quite an assortment of marine life. On summer weekends, it's not at all uncommon to have three or four boats anchored over the site. Before jumping in, I take a few moments to give a site briefing to the divers on board the Rebel today. Now it's time to suit up and go diving. Note that Mike uses shampoo in the latex wrist seals of his dry suit in order to make his hands slip through the seals easier. It's always wise to watch for these little tricks of the trade that other divers have developed over the years. Individual equipment that can be observed on a charter boat is as varied as the divers themselves. This diver opts for a full face mask with double tanks, while most choose to wear a single tank for the depth of this site. Before long, we're suited up, and it's time to take the plunge. One by one, we each make our way to the Rebels' starboard side and jump into the clear but chilly Atlantic, eager to see what awaits us below. Stay tuned. When Dive Wreck Valley returns, we'll be descending to explore the remains of the Iberia. As we descend through the translucent Atlantic, we find that conditions are actually quite good today. Horizontal visibility is about 10 to 15 feet, which is more than enough for filming on this huge wreck site. The Rebel's grapple hook has been tied into the wreck, so it won't break free while we're filming below. Mike's head-mounted Knight Rider light conveniently illuminates the area directly in front of him, allowing both hands to be free for digging or using a reel. Divers choosing to wear a head-mounted light should also note that the beam angle is adjustable and can be moved vertically to any desired angle. As with any underwater light, it's very important not to shine the powerful beam into your dive partner's eyes. To do so would temporarily ruin his night vision and at the very least create a very unhappy dive partner. The Iberia's remains have given in to the elements of time, collapsing into a pile of low-lying scattered debris. Couple this with the sometimes limited visibility, and it's not hard to realize that navigation around this site can be quite tricky. Mike chooses to utilize a dive reel for easy navigation. Reels are a mandatory accessory for wreck divers. They're used not only for navigation and penetration, but can also serve as an emergency ascent line. Mike attaches his reel near the Rebel's grapple hook and then swims freely off, letting line out as he swims off to explore the Iberia's remains. After his dive, Mike will just reel his way back in to the anchor. We pass the Rex boiler, as well as a large winch, two of the Iberia's key navigational landmarks. Meanwhile, Bill Campbell and I have located the Iberia's cargo hold area. Our plan today is to dig up the crate ends, which when preserved become nice artifacts. Billy works on the first wooden crate end. He knows from experience to gently wiggle the waterlocked wood in order to break it free from the hard packed mud bottom suction. Note that the silty bottom is quickly kicked up, reducing visibility to near zero. After a little work, Bill emerges from the silt with a beautiful crate end. The writing on each front end says Arnold Cheney and Company, 148 Water Street, New York. Most of the Dive Wreck Valley filming team chooses to wear dry suits for thermal protection while exploring Northeast shipwrecks. Even though it's mid-season and the surface water is warming, temperatures beneath the thermocline and on the bottom are still quite chilly. Dry suits are always highly recommended for warmth and comfort on any of Wreck Valley's intermediate or deeper shipwrecks especially if a long working dive is planned. This site is home to an assortment of marine life. Small ling hide within the shelter of the wreck, while sea snails inhabit the sand surrounding the site. Starfish are quite abundant here. This one's feeding on resident mussels. Flukes are also found on the site throughout the season. The Iberia is also a good place to find lost diving equipment. Here, Mike finds a lead weight, lost recently by another wreck diver. Diver Rick Schwarz has also chosen to use a dive reel for navigation today. Rick is in the wreck's stern section. The Iberia's huge propeller shaft is a landmark that provides instant recognition as to the diver's exact location on the wreck site. Rick manages to wiggle through the remaining shaft support box. He'll follow the prop shaft astern towards the Iberia's propeller. 
to explore shipwrecks and search their remains for artifacts and lobsters is a fascinating adventure that's only possible through the sport of scuba diving. Divers are a very lucky bunch. The beauty, thrill, and excitement of the underwater world is something that our landlocked counterparts may never truly appreciate. Scuba diving is fast becoming the sport of the 90s. Modern equipment and training methods have made the sport safe and enjoyable. If you're not already a certified diver, contact your local dive store and learn just how easy it is to get certified and start exploring our beautiful underwater world. This huge four-bladed steel propeller marks the wreck's stern. One of the blades is broken off, but the landmark is still easily recognizable to divers and an excellent backdrop for underwater photographs as well as video. The Iberia's bow section sits alone in the sand. The wreck's bow section is relatively intact and rises a good 20 feet or so off the sandy bottom. This section of the Iberia's wreckage is not often visited by divers since it's broken away from her main wreckage. Divers can also recognize her capstan still mounted in position on the bow's deck, as well as the wreck's bowsprit, which is low lying. Meanwhile, I'm still digging in the same hole. Within a short time, I managed to pull out two crate ends, but both are in poor condition, with little remaining ink writing. After inspecting the ends, I quickly get back to work and settle back into the silty cargo hold. When searching for crate ends, divers should note that crates are stacked. The sides, tops, and bottoms are constructed of thin wood, while the ends are much thicker. The ends are also square rather than rectangular. Since visibility inhibits sight, divers must use their sense of feel to locate the ends. Then it's just a matter of luck as to what condition the ink writing will be in. The Iberia's engine provides the highest relief on the site and must rise a good 30 feet or so off the bottom. We're digging just after her engine on the wreck's starboard side. Recovering the crate ends is no easy job. Divers must feel around until the thicker crate ends are located and then pry and wiggle them out of the mud. A few years back, we decided to retrieve and reconstruct an entire crate. I recovered all the pieces, top, bottom, sides, and ends, and after preservation, we constructed the crates. Since the artifact was to be donated to the Fort Schuyler Maritime Museum, I wanted to recover and fill the crate with the remnants of the Iberia's actual cargo. Unfortunately, the pits, or petrified dates as divers refer to them, are not easily bagged. They float away with even the mildest current, and reduced visibility made it hard just to find the little brown remnants of cargo. Anyway, after almost 15 dives, I had only recovered enough dates to fill a half inch of the crate. Needless to say, the crate is now on display in the museum, but it's not filled with any of her original cargo. Our bottom time is quickly running low. We each start to slowly navigate back towards the Rebel's anchor line, passing her boiler along the way. We actually did quite well today, covering the wreck from bow to stern and still recovering some quality artifacts. Before long, it's time to start our slow ascent towards the surface. At 20 feet, we stop for a safety decompression hang. I'm already planning and looking forward to my next visit to this inshore wreck site. Stay tuned. When we return, we'll be climbing back aboard the Rebel and taking a closer look at the artifacts recovered today. <laughs> After a long and productive dive, it's finally time to climb back aboard the Rebel. We're very lucky and get the opportunity to visit quite a few historical and interesting wrecks each season. The Iberia may not sit in clear offshore waters, but the abundance of artifacts has made her one of the most popular novice wreck sites in the area. I guess they don't come much better than that, do they? Yeah, every once in a while you get one that, that you can read the, even the bottom line, which gives the, the address. Uh -huh. But uh, basically, Iberia was carrying a cargo of uh, golden dates, and these are the uh, remnants of the cases that the dates were packed in. This is a front, and the front
front says Arnold Cheney and Company, the Golden Dates, 100, I think it's 48 Water Street, New York. The back of the crate has, uh, I believe, AAA on it. So what you do when you find these on the bottom, they're usually packed together. The sides are much thinner and longer. You discard those and you don't take those. When you find the thick, shorter pieces, you just grab both of them, wiggle them out, pull them out of the mud, and most times you'll end up with one front and one back. These will actually clean up quite nice um, after they're completely dried out and you leach out all of the mud through warm and cold water rinses. You polyurethane the front to keep the ink intact and it ends up making a nice artifact. And the Iberia, which went down in 1888, really doesn't give up that many artifacts. There's not a lot of brass or china left on the wreck. So most often, if divers are going to find anything on, the, on this particular wreck, this is what they'll come up with. She did pretty good today, good visibility and some artifacts. You can't do any any better than that on the IPR.